Yeah. Bouncer. So and that's all they told me. So. Sergeant at all arms. Okay. Okay. Welcome everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. My name is Abby Driscoll. I'm chair of the board for Sustainable Resilient Longmont. And I'm really excited to see so many people here tonight to talk about sustainability issues in our community. I want to start off by thanking EcoCycle for co-hosting this event and partnering with us uh, on this uh, Canada Forum. I wanted to recognize the members of our board who are here. If everyone who's on the Sustainable Resilient Longmont Board could stand, um, we have some. We're an all-volunteer group, um, which means you know everyone who's on our board puts in a lot of effort to make this organization possible. So thank you so much to the members of the SRL board. provided by one of our volunteers, Aaron. so thank you for doing that, Erin. I also wanted to thank Liz Lane for moderating. It's been great working with you, Liz, to, to you know get to get here, and um, she's uh, just a great, um, been a great professional, doing wonderful things at KGNU, so thank you for being part of this. And thanks to all the candidates for being here. Um, I started getting all the RSVPs in, and I we just like started getting more and more excited when I when uh, more and more people said they were going to be here. I know how hard you all are working right now, so we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy campaign schedule to join us. And um, I just also wanted to mention Sustainable Resilient Longmont. As I mentioned, we're an all volunteer group. We have our first ever fundraiser coming up on October 25th at Left Hand Brewing, 6 to 9 p.m. We're going to have live music. $25 will get you in the door. Uh, Hefe is, is sponsoring a t deluxe taco bar. So $25 will get you a beer for the first 50 people and a taco bar and live music and you get to support our organization. So keep it in mind, October 25th at Left Hand Brewery. So with that, um, I'd really like to um, introduce Sam Jones, who is the executive director of EcoCycle. Um, thank you so much for being here and being part of this. So, thank you so much, Abby. We are thrilled, EcoCycle is thrilled to be co-hosting this event. Uh, it's a really important event and we're so glad you all are here. I'm assuming you know who EcoCycle is, but just to refresh anybody's memory, um, EcoCycle is a 41-year-old community organization. We're a nonprofit social enterprise working to advance recycling, composting, and other zero waste solutions in Boulder County and beyond. I'd like to recognize our board member, Dan Benavides, here in the audience. <laughs> I'll just note that EcoCycle and Longmont have a long history together, dating back to the 80s, when I bet you some of you in the room were volunteers helping to gather recyclables and school buses um, back before there was curbside recycling, and then um, EcoCycle uh, ran the first uh, diversion center back in the day and processed material, materials here for 20 years and continue to work with many of you to help Longmont reach its zero waste goals. So we're all in this together. I should also note that uh, EcoCycle runs uh, the Boulder County Recycling Center where all of your single stream recycling goes to get processed. So I feel very intimately at, uh, in touch with your recyclables. <laughs> <laughs> and we also teach in all the St. Brain and Boulder Valley School District schools about environmental ed. So anyhow, glad to be here. I'll just wanna un I just want to underscore how important it is what we do at the local level. Um, the folks back in D.C. are fighting and getting nothing done, and increasingly it's up to the cities to lead. And we know sustainability and climate change and other matters are very, very urgent with Houston flooding and California burning. And so what, what we do matters. And so it's, it's great that all the candidates are here. Um, it's great that Longmont is playing such an important role, and um, this is an important election um, for the stage for the future. So, kudos to everyone for being here. With that, I want to turn it over to Liz Lane. She is a 25-year uh, 25 year resident of Boulder County. Her day job is um, estate planning. She's an attorney, um, and she's also the producer and anchor at KGNU. So, she's going to be leading us through the night, and we really appreciate her being a part of this. that 
Congrats, Anne. Thank you, Abby. And thank you to your organizations. And congratulations for putting together this really amazing collaboration of your organizations <laughs> to, uh, to focus on issues of importance to the Longmont community. Um, thank you so much to all the candidates and for your uh, previous and, and current service to Longmont and for being here tonight. I really appreciate your time at this critical time of election season. Yes, you can't hear me. Sorry. Okay. okay. Here. So, okay. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. I am Liz Lane. I'm a volunteer producer uh, and anchor at KGU Radio, KGU Community Radio. And um, uh, we do a lot of uh, candidate debates, a lot of local issue debates, and feel like uh, it's a huge service and important duty of our radio station to provide access to candidates uh, and opportunity for listeners and for citizens to uh, hear thoroughly about all the issues. So this is kind of an extension of that, and I've been really honored to be invited to do this, and I've loved getting to know more about Longmont and the issues of concern to all of you. So before I introduce the candidates, just a little bit on the order of the evening and how we will uh, go through the debate tonight. The organizers of this event, EcoCycle and Sustainable Resilient Longmont, identified, uh, prioritized of the many topics that, be, that could be covered, four um, main topics that they wanted to uh, cover first this evening. So we will do that. Uh, those topics are renewable energy, windy gap, fracking, and zero waste. Um, after we go through those questions, uh, there we will um, collect a couple of questions from the audience and ask those. There will be a brief uh, couple of yes or no questions that we want to get the candidates on record about. Uh, and if there's time, we will move on to a couple of other important issues that um, we would all like to get to if there's time. And the candidates will have the opportunity at the end for a one minute closing statement. So if uh, there aren't any questions, maybe this is a good time for people to check their cell phones and turn them off. And um, if there are no questions by the candidates, then it is my pleasure to introduce all of them. I'll begin with the candidates for mayor. Uh, Brian Bagley is a current city council member for Ward 1. He has held his seat since 2011, and he is chief counsel at the Bagley Law Firm, which represents businesses, families, and individuals. Roger Lang has also served on city council. He has been on that city council for six years. He served as mayor of Longmont from 2007 to 2009. Roger is a retired telecommunications worker and he currently works as a financial advisor. Sarah Levison served on Longmont city council from 2007 to 2015. She has been employed during her career by county and federal governments, university, real estate, and small businesses. Uh, we're going to move now to the at-large candidates for city council. <coughs> Polly Christensen has been an at-large city councilor since 2014. She's a former small business owner and former managing editor and art director at CU Boulder. Ron Gallegos served on Longmont City Council from 1995 to 1999. Uh, Ron is a Colorado native and currently works as an abstract artist and financial consultant. Next, we have Catherine Jarrett. Kathy has lived in Longmont since 1971, and she spent her career in the St. Brain Valley School District, working with children and adults with disabilities. Aaron Rodriguez was born and raised in Longmont. He worked for 10 years touring as an opera singer before uh, settling down to his current <coughs> career, which is in real estate valuation. And Alex Samory has served on 15 boards and commissions in Longmont and was elected to city council from 2009 to 2013 and currently he serves as the ex executive director of the Longmont Entrepreneurial Network. And then finally, last but not least, the Ward 2 candidates. Jeff Moore is a Longmont City Council member. He's been serving on City Council since he was elected in 2013. He is a retired manufacturing engineer and he's lived in Longmont for 22 years. And Marsha Martin is retired from her career in the Colorado tech industry where she broke ground as a woman in a male-dominated field. She spent the last part of her tech career working on renewable energy. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. So we are going to start with the uh, topic of renewable energy. And um, the, the first question will go to the three mayoral candidates. Everybody will have two minutes. Thank you so much. Everybody will have two minutes to answer the question. And Greg, thank you so much for being our dutiful timekeeper. He will raise a, um, a card to you when you have one minute last, 30 seconds, and then done. 
stop. Great. So um, this is the first question. And I guess I'll start um, uh, third, since I introduced Brian first. I will begin with Sarah and then move to Roger and then end with you, Brian. And this is the question. Longmont gets its power from the Platte River Power Authority. Air and water pollution are putting our health at risk. And we've seen the effects of climate change in our community with the disastrous 2013 flood and wildfires affecting our air quality. The cities of Pueblo, Boulder, and Aspen have passed city council resolutions committing to 100% renewable energy by 2030 for their communities. And Breckenridge and Nederland are reportedly um, considering the same thing. Do you support Longmont transitioning to 100% renewable energy sources by 2030? Why or why not? Two minutes. Sarah Levison. This is prompt. It's on. It's, it's on. on. Okay. Yeah, you can hear me. So I think it's renewable energy is our future. And I think that if we can move towards being 100% renewable by 2030, that's something we need to move towards. Um, how we get there, we will have to work with the other cities that are also partners in the Platte River Power Authority. That's Estes Park, Fort Collins, and Loveland. And we have great relationships built with all those other city elected officials. And I think that um, the more we can each do individually to start our <coughs> mindset thinking about 100% renewable by 2030 is going to um, let us lead by example. Um, so I, I um, do agree strongly we should move towards that laudable goal of 100% by 2030. Thank you. Roger, same question. Do you support Longmont transition to 100% <coughs> renewable energy sources by 2030? Why or why not? I do. I think it's a goal that we should shoot for. If we uh, don't set a goal aggressive like that, we won't get to where we want to be in the near future. Um, I think we're fortunate with Platte River Power Authority. Uh, as some of you may or may not know, they have already taken great steps to get away from fossil fuel for their electricity generation. They at the present time generate about 67% of their power through fossil fuels. The rest of it's wind power and solar. They have um, some pretty significant plans to increase their wind power generation. So they are aggressively going after this, as probably all of us hope they will. Um, they are going to come out with a cost analysis on what it would take them to be completely renewable power generation by 2030. That study will be out later this year. It will be interesting to see uh, what the ramifications of that are. Um, as I'm sure you know, cost is going to be a factor, but. Uh, the, uh, the end product is something that uh, we are all, all hopeful for. And uh, I applaud Platte River for the steps they've already taken there. Their uh, fossil fuel generation is less than public service. Uh, and uh, so less than Colorado as a state. So I think they're making great, great strides and we're well on our way to uh, reaching a goal that uh, maybe we don't think is feasible, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's could be reachable, and we've got a great partner who will help us do that. Thank you. And I'd like to ask the candidates when they respond, henceforth, to stand up because folks in the back can't actually see who's speaking. So <laughs> they still won't be able to see me if I'm standing. <laughs> 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 here, Sarah, you can stand right here. So, so uh, Brian, the same question to you. Oh, okay, great. So I should stand? Yes, that would okay, be helpful. Thank great. You. My name is Brian Bagley. I'm running for mayor. Um, this is a difficult answer and a difficult question. So yes, uncategorically, I am for 100% renewable energies by 2030. However, the question becomes, how do we get it done? I am absolutely opposed to what Aspen does, because they're not really 100% renewable. They buy, with all their money, renewable energy credits, and they are not truly renewable. Right now, we could be 100% renewable, theoretically, if everybody in this room goes out and checks the box with the city that says for $3.12, $3 cents, for $3 and earth, 3.12 cents for every uh, 100 kilowatt hours generated or purchased, you could choose to use just green energy. I don't know if everybody knew that. I didn't know that until recently. So you could check that, check that box. But the problem is if everybody in Longmont, all 97,000 of us, check that box, 
there's not enough renewable or green energy to go around. So, for example, if we do it and all the cities in, Longmont, or in Colorado do it, we all become like these three cities, there's still not enough renewable energy. So what we need to do is do uh, what we're doing. If you talk to Tom Roniotis at Longmont Power, they're actually, Platte River is pushing forward with the study. At the end of this month, we will know whether or not it's technologically feasible. Then by the early spring months of 2018, we'll know how much will it cost to truly become 100% uh, carbon free. Right now we've got 19% of our power coming from hydro, 9.86% coming from uh, wind, total 32% carbon free right now. That's a big, big, big long journey from now until two, uh, 2030. Can we do it? Yes. But we can't just say, oh, let's do it and ideologically stamp it. It's going to take work. It's going to take data. It's going to take time. At the same time, we need to make sure that our rates just don't go skyrocket. Thank you very much. So we are continuing on this topic of renewable energy, but this is just a yes or no question to the rest of the candidates. So I'll begin with the Ward 2 candidates. And Marsha, I'll start with you. Uh, it's just a yes or no. If you were asked today to vote on a resolution to commit Longmont to moving to 100% renewable energy by 2030, would you vote yes or no on such a resolution? Yes. OK, and let's um, move that to Jeff. Yes. And now we'll go to the at-large candidates. <coughs> we will begin um, with Polly at the far end. Just yes or no? Yes. yes. Um, probably no, because I don't think it's feasible. Feasible. Oops, I'm sorry. I would probably vote no because I don't think it's feasible. Yes. 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 Okay. That's yours. <laughs> okay. um, the next topic is Windy Gap. And uh, we're going to address this question to the at large candidates. And I'm going to begin on this side of the table. And this is the question. On November 7th, Longmont voters are being asked to approve a $36 million bond issue to fund 10,000 acre feet storage of Windy Gap water. Given that there is a discrepancy of 4,000 acre feet between what staff recommended would be optimal capacity and what the city council is supporting, do you support the bond issue and why? And it's two minutes, excuse me, yes, two minutes each. I'm Alex Samori and I'm running for council at large. And I do support the Windy Gap uh, bond issue. Reason being, Longmont, since its inception, has been forward thinking in preserving or in bringing water to the town and making sure that as we grew, there was enough water supply for everyone. By doing the Windy Gap project, which the city has been actually been working on for 20 years now, among other communities, that will ensure that as we grow and hit our 120,000 or more uh, households, persons, that we'll have adequate water supply to meet the needs of everyone. I know there's some disagreement in terms of the 6,000 or 10,000, but you have to account for evaporation of the water, uh, loss uh, down the river, because when we don't use it, it's just flowing anyway. So, absolutely, I think it's a good thing for the community long term and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. All right, hello, friends. My name is Aaron Rodriguez. I'm also running at large. Uh, very good to see you all here tonight for what are very, very important issues, in my opinion. As far as the Windy Gap uh, issue on the ballot, I am a no. I want it to be returned to council for better negotiations and negotiations that include more options that we were given. There were three options given, 6,000, 8,000, and 10,000 at the city council meeting. I think their alternative uh, availability to us to negotiate, considering that Union Reservoir is supposed to be a future source of water for the city. And so I would like to renegotiate so we start improving Union Reservoir to be that resource. As well, I just want to segue a little bit we need to protect Union Reservoir because I think a lot of us know uh, some of the applications as far as oil and gas development are going towards there. One other thing I would like to talk about as far as Winnie Gap though is 
I don't want the city of Longmont to be a water war city. Uh, because this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to sit there and we're going to try to buy as much water as we humanly can to ensure our city has what we need. But is that being a good neighbor to our other municipalities? No, it is not. Is it being a good neighbor to our environment? No, it is not because we are depleting the west slope. The western slope and the Colorado River could be completely decimated by this project with the inclusion of climate change added in. And with that, I do not support it. Thank you very much. Ron Gallegos, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I reluctantly support the 10,000. I, I was one of those that was advocating a compromise position, which was 8,000 feet. But this is one of those questions about lost opportunity. Can we really get it back if we miss this opportunity? I thought, a, a lot of thought went into this process, and uh, we got recommendations from both staff and the water board. And I know there was some ser serious discussion. I went back to the water board and said, well, what really is the difference? And uh, it really came down to uh, kind of short-term versus long-term. And their thinking is they want to be absolutely uh, safe. Kind of the, uh, the belt suspender crowd, that's where the water board is coming from, with the 10,000 recommendation. As I said, I would fill kind of in the middle and, and went with eight. So uh, I think it's an investment in our future. Uh, let's not kid ourselves, it's going to be expensive, but we may not have the opportunity again to deal with this issue. So I think we need to be thoughtful, and I guess my focus to move forward. Thank you. Uh, Kathy. Kathy Jarrett, running for City Council at large. I do support the Windy Gap uh, Ferment Project. We already own that water. We just don't have a place to put it. And so if we um, have the uh, Windy Gap Bourbon Project um, bond issue, we will be able to take advantage of the, wind, the water we already own. Other cities are involved in this. I think it's 11 different um, cities and water boards. So the water will be um, going into the reservoir. We need to get our little part of it because we don't know what the future holds. We don't know how many people are going to be here. We don't know how many of your grandchildren and children and their children will be here in Longmont in the future. And I think we need to be on the conservative side that we would provide for them, just like the people before us provided for us. Um, and I don't have much more to say, so I'll just, because a lot of people have already said what I have agreed with. So I'll pass it on to Polly. Um, my name is Molly Christensen. I'm currently uh, city council at large, and uh, I do believe that our I am not for the Windy Gap Farming Project at this rate. We are going to build the Windy Gap Farming Project. Our city staff has been working on it for 20 years, so that's not the issue. We, for 20 years, the city staff has been saving the money so that we wouldn't have to increase the rates at the 6,000 foot level, or 6,000 acre foot level. Um, <clears throat> our city staff is full of engineers. They have run simulations <coughs> on the possibilities of long-term droughts of 130,000, 150,000 people. They've run many, many simulations because that's what they do. They're engineers. The uh, water board are not engineers. The main dispute comes between um, the um, we have water exchanges, we have num numerous water exchanges, and that's the difference between the estimates of um, what, what we need. People who, uh, like the water board, who say we should not count those in our, in, as what we uh, project, um, versus the city staff who says, we have those, we've had them for a long time. If when anybody pulls out of them, we have 15 years to make some other uh, choices. So I don't believe that that's the problem. Our, our forefathers were thrifty. They bought enough. They didn't buy too much. That's the way most of us were raised. You buy too much, it's just a waste. And you become a water hoarder or 
whatever. And I don't believe in that, and I don't believe that the citizens of the city need to pay uh, this much of an increase for water that we don't really need, for excess water that we don't need. Thank you so much. So uh, continuing with the topic of Windy Gap, we're just going to do a brief question that, on that topic that I will address to each of the other candidates. So um, I'll start with the mayoral candidates and then move to Ward 2. closer to the mic? Sure, sorry. So I'm going to address just a briefer version of the same question to the rest of the candidates. And I'll begin um, with the mayoral candidates and move to Ward 2. And I'll start with you, Brian, because I finished with you last time. And this is the question. If you are elected to city council and the Windy Gap issue firming project comes back to council would you vote yes or no on the current plan just need one word answer uh yes you will you but is this a yes no it, question or is it, it a, is a yes no question yes yes wait are you, it is yes. a yes no <laughs> would you vote yes or no on the current plan if it came if back it came to back, council yeah, if it no back. if you mean if it was rejected by the voters and came back that's the question if okay it came no back to council no Roger. Uh, if it came back to council, I would like to renegotiate the number, and uh, I guess I would not support the current plan. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's the trick question. No. It's a trick question. And then uh, down to the word two candidates. Marcia? It is a trick question, and the morality of this is much bigger than you know, but the answer is no. Answering a question that you don't know what you're voting on <laughs> is really kind of silly. But uh, I would have to, we'd have to see what's going on. I, if the voters rejected it, though, it's, there's got to be some, some consideration behind that. So, no. All right. Thank you so much. So moving on now to the issue of fracking. Uh, and we're, I am going to begin with the Ward 2 candidates on this topic. You will have um, two minutes to answer the question, um, Marcia and Jeff. And this is the question. Longmont voters approved a ballot measure in 2012 banning hydraulic fracturing within Longmont city limits. Subsequently, the Colorado State Supreme Court overturned the ban. Now the city sees there are plans for fracking on the southern edge of Longmont coming up as far as Quail Road. At the same time, plans are moving forward for permits at Union Reservoir. These combined will further degrade Longmont's air quality and put us at risk for other health and safety concerns. If you are elected to city council, what role will you advocate for the city of Longmont to regulate oil and gas interests and pipelines? Who's first? Um, uh, who went first the first time? I think uh, we haven't had a real question. Okay. Yet. Well, then, Marcia, <laughs> why you go first? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I think that there are no circumstances under which the city of Longmont should issue any fracking permits. And I think I think that as a city we need to be prepared to do everything we can do to stop it. Right now, there's an easy answer. The city should issue no permits until the lawsuit Martinez versus COGCC is settled. If that is settled favorably, then we can de we can deny permits indefinitely until the gas and oil business can prove itself safe because the burden of proof will be on them. If the lawsuit is settled unfavorably for us, then we're going to have to think up some other reasons not to do it because I don't believe there's a person in this room that thinks it is safe, that thinks it is moral, or that thinks that we should even take a chance on something like that happening in our city. We don't need the energy, we don't need the revenue, and we don't need the sick children that that's already bringing us in Erie and Broomfield. So I think we should just be stacking up straw men and making them knock them down. It's a tough question because here's, here's what, what's happened at the Supreme Court. Is the Supreme Court struck down our ban, so it's not like we can just say no. 
<coughs> what we can do is negotiate in good faith with, with the operators to, to minimize the hazard that there is there. I don't. I would prefer there was never any fracking out there. I don't see how we can stack up enough straw men to, to knock this down, though. I mean, they will get in court injunctions. They will move this forward. They will. They're going to go after those resources. Not cooperating. Excuse me, I have the floor. Not cooperating is going to create a different situation where we could end up with them deciding what to, what they're going to do and not not even consider our positions and make it so that we have even a worse situation than, we, than what we can end up with with our with our current negotiations. So we need to make sure that whatever we do in our negotiations that we are requiring higher levels of protections for the environment and for the air quality so that I mean I see people are shaking their heads and I understand I I hate frack but I don't see us stopping it they will the state will step in and they'll issue those permits and we'll just be viewed as something that's going to be in the way and we're just going to get kicked to the road and we're just going to run over it so we have to figure out a way to have a sort of a win-win. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and now I'm going to ask a yes or no question uh, to the rest of the candidates on the topic of fracking. And I will begin over here, and I'm going to start with you, Jeff. And this is the question. That's Alex. Alex. Excuse me, Alex, sorry. Um, it's the gray hair. <laughs> so this is a yes or no question. Would you, if elected to council, would you support a resolution to join other governmental entities in Boulder County to develop a plan and a strategy to prevent future oil and gas development in Boulder County? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I don't think so. Probably no. Yes, we did that last night. Okay, and uh, going to the mayor's, and we'll start with Sarah. Yes. Yes. I voted for it last night. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. So we are now moving on to zero waste as the topic. And this goes to the mayoral candidates. And just to keep people on their toes, 90 seconds is your time to answer this question. So um, I guess I will begin with Brian and move through the mayoral candidates. And then we'll talk to Ward 2 and the at-large candidates. This is the uh, preamble to the question. Longmont City Council voted in 2016 unanimously, 6-0, to adopt a sustainability plan. In that plan, the city set out a goal of increasing community-wide waste diversion to 50% by 2025. Currently, Longmont recycles and compost 31% compost of its waste. We know that the way we produce, transport, use, and discard goods makes a huge contribution to greenhouse gas emissions in addition to depleting natural resources. Is working towards these zero waste goals a priority for you? And what ideas do you have to increase Longmont's diversion rate to reach the city's goal? Brian, you go first. 90 seconds. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, I would encourage everyone to go to uh, Sustainable Resilient Longmont's website to look at the history of their sustainability plan you will actually be able to see my role in passing the sustainability plan. Um, the video's there. I didn't put up the link. You guys did. Um, where I made the motion to bring it back. There was a discussion, and I supported and basically brought a once-dead sustainability plan, but back. So absolutely, yes, I support it. Um, the, uh, I was also very supportive of the composting program. Politically, Longmont doesn't have the will to do 100% composting. It took a lot of creativity and resources in order to work with the council in order to get a composting program put in place. Now, just like with recycling, it will grow. Um, and so uh, I don't think, and so right now what's really a shame is if you actually look, uh, Longmont is only 31% as far as the rate goes of its residential diversion rates. Uh, that's really bad compared to Loveland, who's at 61%, Boulder at 54%, Louisville at 48%, Lafayette at 37%. Again, we're at 31%. And if you ask, well, why are we so low? We do pretty good at recyclables. But 
that's taking into account composting. So we need to encourage our program, uh, we need to enhance our program, and we need to make it more universal. Okay, thank you, Brian. Roger? Do you want me to read this question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Is working toward Longmont's established zero waste goals a priority for you, and what ideas do you have to increase the city's current diversion rate to reach that goal? which is 50% by 2025. Yeah, I, it is a priority for me. However, um, I look at two programs. I start with our recycle program. It's a very popular program. People voluntarily and willingly take on that program and they're glad to do it. Compostables is a whole different story. When I was listening to people testify when they're trying to pass uh, an opt-out portion for compostables, people said, well, I compost now in my backyard. So there's a lot of that going on, but there are a lot of people that just are not ready to do it. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't think we ought to mandate to be successful. I'm, I'm very much in favor of a, of a volunteer program, but we've got to incent the people and let them make the decision. And yes, we've got a long way to go, but I'm in, very encouraged about what we did with recycling. We can do it and we can do it well. And uh, hopefully, compostables will come along in time. But uh, right now, I, 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 all I would say is we need to encourage people to do it. But they're going to have to do it. And I would uh, not like to uh, heavy hand them to do it because it's going to be their choice. OK, Sarah. Sarah Levison running for mayor. Uh, I also support the sustainability plan goal of the waste diversion being up to 50% by 2025. A couple of ideas I have. People who live in multifamily um, buildings don't have an opportunity to compost. Um, people that have small yards, maybe they have a yard service that takes away their grass clippings and any of the yard waste, those people are, might only be generating a very small amount of compostable material from their kitchen. Um, one idea I had is that we could have households combine, smaller households, to do one uh, compostable in. It would give everybody an opportunity. How we count, how many people are composting is another matter there. Um, I also think we need to look at how we can be more sustainable at the grocery store. I know other communities in Colorado have a bag credit that you can have um, or uh, they charge you for a plastic bag if you take one. Look at what we can do to reduce the waste treatment. We do something simple like that. And some of that money could maybe go back into the program to encourage people to compost more and to divert more waste. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and I'm, I'm going to move on now to the board uh, two candidates about, around the issue of sustainability. And I'm going to begin with Jeff. Um, Jeff, the Longmont and Marcia, the Longmont Sustainability Plan outlines strategies for achieving the city's waste reduction goals. Among these strategies are building support for curbside composting, increasing public education around waste reduction <coughs> opportunities, and adopting a commercial recycling ordinance. Which of these strategies, if any, will you prioritize in order to reach Longmont's zero waste goals? Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think um, where I think we have the biggest opportunities in the commercial waste stream, uh, if we look at restaurants and multifamily dwelling units. So I think that that's really gonna would be the biggest bang for the buck and that's where I would wanna start. All of these things have add value though and I think it changes the mindset of individuals. If they understand that there's a way to compost without all the negative um, feedback that we hear about other people <coughs> and it, how it smells and all that. Our compost doesn't smell. We take care of it, We have, I mean, we had to generate about one bag of compost a week. We were on the every other week trash pickup, which generates a lot of times just only one trash bag a week. And that's because we've diverted that compost into a separate stream, so we don't have the garbage set we used to have. And we fully recycle everything. I encourage everybody I talk to to drop back into the every other week trash if they can, like my neighbor lives alone, but he's got the 96 gallon can. <laughs> and I said, you're oversubscribed. You're paying 20 bucks when you could be paying uh, uh, you know, six or seven dollars. So 
I think that there's a big, there's a good story to be told out there, and I think we just need to continue the conversation to make sure that everybody understands how to do it in a way that really works for for uh, the city. Thank you, Marsha. Marsha Martin, Ward Two, and I think Jeff really hit upon the piece of lowest hanging fruit that there is. We didn't market the composting plant very well. You know, I had to sit down and do the math, not that it was very hard math, but I bet a lot of people didn't do it. If you go to every other week garbage, then even though you've got that big green composting bin, you're still paying less than you were before. We should be packaging by bundles so that people know, oh, if I go to this method, I'm paying less. And that was not obvious at all when the city rolled out the program. And I believe that that and that alone is the reason that it's only at 15% when it could easily be at 30 or 35% because most people in Long Mind care about the environment and care about not adding methane. So it's just a matter of marketing. And apart from that, I really sincerely believe that we should be pursuing all of the methods that have been mentioned because there's just no reason not to do it. It's not that expensive. Okay, thank you for that. And now I'm going to move to the at-large candidates. And again, this is on the topic of zero waste. And we'll start down with you, Polly. Um, what do you see as the role of city council in reaching Longmont's zero waste goals and you know, implementing the plan? Um, uh, I think city council can urge staff to do a little more, uh, a little more outreach for education. Um, I would also like to see us, although we have no control over the schools, to me, having a little kid pester you day after day is a very good uh, way for people to change their habits. <laughs> I tried it on my parents, and my son certainly tried it on me, and it's pretty effective. Uh, so if you get if you get kids like to go to the combo center, which I did today with the, the mayor, um, it's incredibly cool, and you realize how much stuff we throw away. And city council can encourage that as well as uh, do an audit, see how it's going, try to figure out um, ways to increase it, and. Um, I, I do think city council has a role. It's a matter of also changing people's habits. That's hard. That's why little kids are a good uh, nagging resource. <laughs> Kathy? I really like the idea of composting, and I think the main thing for the city council will be education. I have been composting in my little kitchen with my little worm bin for a decade or more. Um, also, I have one little bag of grocery, or uh, about a grocery size bag of trash every other week, and I've had it that way for many, many years. I do put all my recyclables in the recycle bin, so I think it's just a matter of helping people know how it can be done. I do like the idea of having maybe one compost bin for multiple families because I took a walk in my neighborhood and I only saw one of those green bins with a green top. So, and that means a truck has to come out to that house and then carry that compost all the way out to Hudson. So that's using a lot of energy um, to take it all the way out to Hudson. I think that it's better to have it right here in town and not um, going out so far. Um, let's see, there, oh yeah, I mulch my, grass clippings into my yard, so um, I don't have grass clippings in my uh, trash. So there's a lot of ways you can do it yourself in your own home. Thank you. The sustainability plan is 149 pages. How many of you have read it? Okay. That, my friends, is the problem. We need to get the entire community educated. We're really serious about this, and I think we are. When we pass the bond initiative to build the, the museum and the rec center and expand the senior center, we had a charrette in the community. And basically, we went out to the community and we sold it like Girl Scouts selling cookies. 
And that's what we need to do with this plan, because I don't think folks understand it. I think po folks in this community, by and large, are pretty positive and pretty progressive. But I think they have to understand what's going on. And we haven't done a very good job. We've built this big uh, thing bigger than a bread box, and it's got all these tentacles, but nobody quite understands what's going on. So as a city council, we can instruct staff to appoint some task forces, get out and really communicate to the community so they understand the direction we're, we're moving in and to get that by you. And I think once that happens, the numbers will start to pick up. Aaron? All right, all right. How are you doing all? <laughs> good, good. Anyway, uh, I'd like to say a little bit uh, about a couple of these things. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit anecdotally about when we rolled out recycling originally. There is a lot of folks that got right on board, and it was easy. They, they could, even back then when we had the two-stream cycling, uh, recycling bins, uh, people did get a little confused, but in essence, it was good, a lot of buy-in. The point being, though, is as, as folks have talked about education, we need to have multifaceted education because a lot of our, our English second, second language residents said that they thought they'd be charged more if they put the recycle bin out on the corner. That was obviously not true, it was one rate. Uh, another thing I would like to talk about as far as the commercial waste goes is that first we need to know what we're dealing with and we don't currently have numbers on that. We don't have data collection on that commercial waste. So we would like to ask, I, I would prefer that city council ask because as the city of Longmont does not provide commercial and our multifamily residential uh, waste services, that we ask those providers that do provide that to start supplying us with numbers so we know what we're dealing with so we can get closer to, uh, to dispersing a, uh, commercial waste in proper ways. Right now we have no idea how that's going, uh, essentially. And so that's, I think, two strong strategies that City Council could go on as far as uh, uh, its, its endeavors towards waste. Alex Samori again. So I'll give you an example. My family probably diverts over 95%. Keep it up, because Okay, we divert over 95% of what we use. We recycle cardboards, plastic, we recycle plastic bags, and we've been composting for over 20 years in our backyard. We mulch our grass, and my daughter actually started a uh, recycling program at her college in Atchison, Kansas, because they weren't recycling there. And my son in Boulder uh, subscribes to buying the renewable energy credits for his apartment. So I think we can lead by example, and I do believe that the city can do a better job of promoting it. I see how they do when they want to push certain projects. They put out a lot of marketing material, a lot of information, and I think we can do a better job of putting that information out to the public as well. All right, thanks to everyone for answers to that. Wow, we're doing great. We've gotten through the uh, sort of core topics that the organizers wanted to get through, and um, now we're going to move. We did um, collect some questions from the audience, and we are going to uh, cover those now. And one of them is, uh, I think, a nice follow to the discussion of zero waste and sustain sustainability. So this is going to go to all the candidates, and everybody has a minute and a half to answer this. Um, and I'll start with the uh, War II candidates, and I'll start again with you, Marcia. And this is the question. The city of Longmont passed a sustainability plan in 2016, and the three pillars of sustainability, which those who read the uh, report know, are environmental protection, responsible economic growth, and social equity. How would you support a strong implementation of Longmont's sustainability plan, and what is your vision of what a sustainable city looks like? A sustainable city is, first of all, a lot less green. And I've been studying very hard because I believe that we do not know the correct ethical answer as well as the correct probable answer to the little gap issue. And because of that, what I've been able to determine so far is that the real ethics are around conservation of <coughs> water. And that is a sustainability issue that goes to the people and the planet aspect of sustainability. And what we need to do is become a city that conserves water 
Denver has run ahead of us and made sure and showed us how it's possible. The city should pass ordinances and in incentives to zero escape. We should have rainwater be uh, systems be required in new single family homes. And a lot of things should change so that in the future, Longmont looks like the plains that surround us instead of some oasis of, of Ireland that's green. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not Longmont, and we should learn to conserve our water. Okay, thank you. Can you repeat the question? Sure. How would you support a strong implementation of Longmont's sustainability plan, and what is your vision of what a sustainable city looks like? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think the implementation of the, of the plan is, is uh, underway. We have hired uh, a sustainability coordinator, which was a big step. If you have a plan, you need someone to implement it. Well, the night closer, please. And, and, <laughs> sorry. Working through how this ties into our Envision Longmont plan as well, and how we develop properties that are still available to develop as greenfield, and the properties that we need to develop as infill. Anything we do in those in this new development, uh, we will need to look at ways to be more efficient in uh, energy usage, more efficient in water usage, more efficient in uh, the land use. Some of the code is changes coming up forward uh, next spring will be narrower lot sizes so we don't have a 50 foot lot you can build a smaller home you, that that in itself you're using less land and you're still providing for a family so I think it's, it's a matter of how we can roll out efficiencies in how we build our city out how we use our resources and where we put our where we put what kinds of development will, will be a, a big part of how we make this plan work. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to the mayoral candidates with that question. And uh, Brian, I think it's your turn to go first. <coughs> Great. Well, I think that uh, there's three legs. Uh, again, being part of the process, we came up to the, with this plan. I mean, there's really three legs. You know, again, the environmental protection, the economy, and social equity. And um, I think that a sustainable uh, city, really, you have to keep focusing and always trying to get better on four key areas our transportation, right? Energy, water, and zero waste. And then at the same time, those of us and most of us in this room uh, are blessed financially. We're probably blessed with good education, with a love for our community. But there are other people out there that aren't as blessed, and they're not here. And the one question we need to always ask as we're moving forward is, how will the less fortunate be impacted? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that right now we have we have we're making great progress. We can do so much more. But uh, we actually uh, in 2008 uh, we passed uh, a master plan for water, for example. Um, we will be voting later on in the year. Uh, this is a draft now, the 2017 draft. There are several ways that we conserve water. Even though I'm for the Windy Gap project, 10,000 acre feet, I'm also more for our raw water policy and actually taking action to conserve water. Um, I never said that we're going to use the water at Windy Gap. We let it go down the river. We just use it if we need it in the future. We don't even take it from the river. We just want the option. So we need to focus on all three of those things. Thanks, Brian. Roger? I have uh, read the sustainability program pretty thoroughly in the last week. Uh, because, to be honest with you, I did not know it front to back. But everything in there, and there's about 10 broad categories, everything in there is an improvement in our quality of life as a general public. It's a good plan, it's good for us, it's trying to do the right thing for us uh, and our environment. Uh, my only concern is at what cost, and we're gonna have to cross that bridge. We're gonna want these things, but there's gonna be some costs involved, and we're just gonna have to measure it carefully and decide what do we wanna pay for a better quality of life, because in some cases, that's exactly what it boils down to. I think we all want a better quality of life, but uh, it's not free, but it's a good plan. I'd support it completely if I was elected. And everything in there is to make a better life for all of us. And uh, again, as I repeat, 
it's at what cost, and hopefully we can be uh, smart enough and efficient enough to understand, to minimize the cost so we can get the good out of this plan without uh, breaking the bank. And there's a lot of people that uh, are going to have a hard time increasing their payments and their costs because they're on fixed incomes. That's going to be the tough thing. So uh, that's uh, it's a great plan, and I hope we can implement it, and I hope we can implement it successfully at very little pain to the public. And Sarah. So can any of you see what I'm holding up here? What do you see? Okay, that is the fate of the sustainability plan when the first term I was on council. We had a sustainability plan in 09, and a new council came in and killed it. It was a good plan. We had a sustainability coordinator, and then everything in sustainability dropped to nothing in this city. And it's only recently, because of groups like Sustainable Brazilian Longmont and EcoCycle making this push, and us being more aware of climate change and other aspects that are happening around us to preserve our planet when it's such a critical um, time right now. So I want to remind you, there was a sustainability plan. It's great that finally one was uh, passed. But one thing I found missing when I read it is an accountability. There were no budget items saying, council will be reminded when it comes budget time what to invest in to keep the goals moving forward. Without that key reminder, council will just go ahead when the budget is submitted and not even think about it. I'm a budget hawk. I've been known to be a detail person. Every one of those years I was on council, and I really think that if I'm mayor, I'm going to look at those details and make sure we get some numbers behind the sustainability plan. And again, it's going to be a balancing act between what else is in the budget. But sustainability in all those three tenants is an important thing for our city to move forward. Thank you. So this question is coming over to you guys, and we're going to start with you, Alex, and I'll just repeat it because a lot of people have said a lot of things. Um, how would you support a strong implementation of Longmont's sustainability plan, and what is your vision of what a sustainable city looks like? I'll have to admit, I have not read the plan. However, I'll have to admit, I have not read the plan. However, I do believe in the sustainability. And I think some of the things that we can do is A, improve our transportation within the city by having better mass transit. RTD has let us down majorly in not bringing the light rail or rail to Longmont. And they keep reducing our bus service because they keep saying there's not enough ridership. So we need to push hard on them to get that better bus service in town. I think that will reduce our carbon footprint. I think we need to increase our use of green building. We haven't really pushed for that in the city. I know Boulder does a very good job of it and other communities, and I think we need to start incenting builders to do that as well. And other than that, each one of us needs to do their part in making sure that we reduce our carbon footprint. And as my parents always used to tell me, everything in moderation. Sometimes we seem to go into excess with things. So if we can become more balanced and more moderate in our use of gas and electricity and water, we can be really sustainable. Thank you. Aaron. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> so the, you know, there's been six uh, candidates that have spoken on the subject already. And so I don't think there's going to be a lot of new information to give you. I do believe the concept, though, being that it's a multifaceted approach. We do need to do transportation. We need to increase our multimodal transportation plan. We have one of those, too, that, that works into this. Uh, we need to deal with the water and how we use the water. Obviously, the biggest uses of users of water in this city are commercial businesses in the city. The city obviously has a lot of control on how they use water. Uh, Talking about sustainability, where we get our electricity from. Again, going to 100% renewables, not just by 2030, because that's irresponsible for me to say, because I don't know if I'm going to be serving on council in 2030. I promote just trying to move bench or make benchmarks, set benchmarks that are attainable in the near term. For instance, I'd like to see 50% renewable energy by 2021, which would essentially be four years if elected. 
Uh, and that's what I'm talking about, is being responsible about the promises you make, right? Also, I just want to say one thing, that as far as sustainability plan goes, any plan is not worth anything unless you operationalize it and set benchmarks. We need to set those specific goals and benchmarks to see when it comes to the plan. Thank you. As was mentioned, this is a three-pronged approach. Or three elements like a school. I think the environmental component has got a lot of champions here. I think we understand that concept. When I look around, there's an old Spanish saying about white rice and me being the raisin and the white rice. We really need to sell this to the other elements of the community as well. Because this isn't just an exclusively white privilege issue. It involves Hispanics, it involves poor people, it involves the business community as well. There are two other rungs to this ladder or uh, legs on this stool. And I think that's important. And that's what the council really needs to, to do if they're serious about selling this plan to make it inclusive for everyone. Because it's not only the environment, it's the business environment, that kind of sustainability. Can we afford to have the economy to continue to be a community? And it has to have an inclusive element. It has to include those people who are not represented well here tonight and have not been well represented in the other two forums that I've seen. And hopefully tomorrow night it will get better. But this is a community made up more than the, just the people in this room. And I think we have to be thoughtful about that as well. So I'm probably about as popular as a turd in a punch bowl, but I'm not going to say I do believe we need to take care of this beautiful planet that we have been blessed to live on. Um, I think we can do more, and especially as far as water goes, and there's a lot of things that we can use drip irrigation, which I've used in my um, growing of plants, like tomatoes and peppers and things like that, um, to really reduce the amount of water that um, will evaporate into the air instead of go into the roots of the plant. Um, I also use my bicycle as my main means of transportation for most of my life. All over, I've ridden it all over Longmont when I lived in Boulder before I moved to Longmont in 71. I rode it all over Boulder. I think we have to be a little bit careful because there have been um, more and more adults riding bikes and there have been more and more adults killed riding bikes. So I think we need to be really careful that we um, have good ways for people to get around on their bikes without um, being in conflict with cars. Um, let's see. What else? I think for um, gray water systems, I think that would be great for new construction. I can't see how it could work very well in older houses that have already been established. Um, gray water being, oops, my time's up. Sorry. Next. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Um, okay, I, I see that the sustainability plan right now, the city is having a crisis in we don't have uh, enough housing that people can afford, and yet we're building huge piles of housing. Uh, and to me, what we, we, we have, the crisis we are going to have with sustainability is the, the um, difference between the built environment versus the natural environment. We have a beautiful river all the way through. We have to protect it from becoming uh, just an economic engine for a lot of things. Um, for the few, for the developers and the, the people who make a lot of money. But that money is really about our natural corridor and it needs to be distributed to the whole town, not to uh, just kept in the pockets of the few. So we, we are reaching a crisis point between the economic development that only uh, benefits a few and the natural environment that benefits everyone here. And it's free. you know, everybody, no matter what their, their income level, can take a walk along the park and feel happy. That's one thing we need to protect. Okay, we're going to move
move on to our second uh, question that was um, pulled from among audience questions. And this question has to do, again, with um, smart growth and sustainable development. Um, it also echoes uh, in the preamble a little bit something that uh, Zan said in her introduction, which is that a lot of the responsibility for addressing these issues really is increasingly uh, falling on local, uh, local level, local cities, because of the active climate denial in Washington and overall gridlock. So in light of that, and in light of the fact that approximately 600 acres of land in Longmont has been um, slated for development in the last couple of years, what action uh, do you think that the city should take to implement the smart growth principles for current uh, development projects, the 600 acres that are in the pipeline, and future development pro uh, projects? So again, what actions should the city be taking to implement smart growth and sustainable development principles for the current development projects in the pipeline, as well as future developments? And I think we will go to the mayors for that first. And uh, that would be you, Sally, to start. Or Sarah, excuse me. Sorry, Sarah. Well, I think smart growth is a buzzword. What does it actually mean? So I'll share with you. I read a lot of stuff. And I, I'm very well known. I, I started reading about four or five years ago a blog called Strong Towns. Anybody else read Strong Towns? All right. So Strong Towns. Um, the guy Chuck Marone, who is a civil engineer by trade, um, he's from Minnesota. He is so forward thinking on urban planning and development that they tried to decertify him and take away his license. So a couple of things he talks about, not turning roads, streets, and into stroves, a street that's actually a road. Looking at really what's truly pedestrian friendly so that somebody can actually walk down the street and feel that they have a place on that thoroughfare and it's not just car oriented. You know, a couple of things we could look at. Other cities have done a cap on drive through restaurants. Why do I talk about that? That's something that's been talked about by city planners for about 10 years now. Um, drive through restaurants take a lot of land up, so if you look at the environmental aspect of cars <coughs> idling, that's um, not great. The other thing is, it takes up so much space, you could actually have another retail establishment on the same amount of land if you didn't have a drive through So looking at a couple ideas like that. That's tough, thanks, Sarah. Roger. Okay, when I think of smart growth, uh, there's two items I'd, I'd like to talk about. First is the type of growth that we're experiencing over the last couple, three years. Uh, what worries me is, and I've said this before, uh, we are building a lot of apartments. I was looking at some numbers. Out of 1,600 units that are under construction or uh, on a drawing board, they're all market rate apartments. And what that does is that takes our firefighters, our teachers, our first responders, and, and puts them out of the running for having an apartment in Longmont. We've got to do a better job of affordable housing in Longmont. And the way it looks to me is we're, we're not on the right track at all. Secondly, as far as the rate of growth, uh, I think what we need to do is we need to start tracking. And we used benchmarks in the past when I was on city council, and we measured things like school capacity benchmarks, traffic studies just measure what's happening to us on how fast we're growing or how slow we're growing. That's something that we need to start doing and we need to set benchmarks on these areas so that we don't overbuild and uh, congest our traffic patterns and uh, that, that's what I think is smart growth. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we, it's interesting during campaign season you get uh, labeled a lot of things and, uh, but I think we should keep doing a lot of the things we've been doing. These include, one, we continue to buy up open space. We leverage our dollars by not just buying the open space, but we purchase what's, what are called conservation easements. We actually go out to the landowners and say, keep your land, we're gonna give you way less money, but you just have to promise that in perpetuity, you're never, per perpetuity, you're never gonna develop it. You'll continue it, to use it as open space in agriculture. Um, we also do not sell or lease our water to frackers. 
Uh, we do not allow any heavy industry to come into our residential neighborhoods or inside city limits and use our resources to basically hurt us. Uh, we also do not sell or lease, we should not sell or lease our water to our neighbors. That's not being a good neighbor, that's just being smart. Because what happens is if we sell our water or lease our water to Frederick, Firestone, Mead, etc., what they're going to do is use that water that they don't currently have and they're going to build on our, our borders. Longmont is designed to be a standalone community. We have our open space, we have our views. At the same time, we need to make sure that we're not over overdeveloping. I've been accused of being an, an uncontrolled growth uh, proponent. I'm not. I've voted down the last several uh, uh, residential apartment units because there's too much going in, too much, uh, too much congestion. We need to find that uh, three bears approach, not too less, not too much, just right. Thank you. Hey, Holly, you're up first on the at-large candidates on this question, and I'll repeat it. It is, um, what actions should the city of Longmont be taken, taking to implement smart growth and sustainable development principles for the current projects in the development pipeline and for future development projects? Um, okay, smart, well, I do think that we need to, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I do think that we need to talk, think more carefully about um, the way we build things. It's true that in some places we can build things that are higher, where it won't uh, obscure things or disturb the neighborhood, where it's more commercial. We can create denser home, denser neighborhoods. We can create uh, walkable neighborhoods so that people don't have to use their car so that people will be encouraged to use their bikes. Um, we need to get better transportation because that would keep people off the roads in the first place. Um, we also need to question whether at the end we want to have continual growth because we won't be able to have continual growth. It will stop. And then what do we do? Then what do we do? So we have to be uh, thinking about you know, 50 years from now. That's what the people who started this town are thinking about, 50 years from now. Um, there are a number of things that we, we, you know, we could do green building. We build a house that is um, more sound than it did. Um, it's cheaper for people. For people who are low income, they don't have to pay as much for their utilities. Oh, okay. Thank you. Kathy. Um, I think we need to do education and maybe um, education for builders especially. Around 30 years ago, I was studying passive solar um, construction. There's a passive solar area in Davis, California, where all the houses are built in a passive solar way, where they have their windows mainly on the south side. They have bike paths that people can use to get around the neighborhood, as well as get into town and get to the university there. Um, I think, as I look around Longmont, most of the houses have their ridge lines in the north-south direction instead of an east-west direction. If it was east-west and you had more, um, more of your area of your house on the south side, it would be easier to have passive solar. Um, I think that's one thing that we could encourage also it would be cheaper for people to live in a passive solar house because they would not need as much um, heat. In fact, there is one passive solar house that's burned outside of Longmont, and a few years ago their total heating bill was $12 for backup of, uh, electric heat for the whole year. So I think that kind of construction could be encouraged. Uh, I was on the city council that uh, set the policy for the 10% set, set aside for affordable housing or cash in lieu of. I think we need to return to that program. I think we're, with a million dollars a year, we're never going to address the issue of affordability in the community, which means that we really need to look at some kind of 20% set aside on rent control for new apartments. We need to be building up and not out. We need to be building more efficiently which means that we need a bypass 
because we, right now traffic is stuck in downtown. We need to be moving and managing traffic more efficiently in the north and north-south direction. Uh, we need to have infill using mini houses. I think that's the wave of the future. And then finally, we need to look at a, a living wage for the people who are trying to struggle here in town that are trying to manage with doing two or three jobs. This should be a community that represents all people. All right, friends, bear with me. I'm going to get a little <coughs> You're not real estate -y on you. Not yet. Anyway, <laughs> I'm get a little real estate -y on you. Uh, I have to talk about a little bit international building codes and standards, OK? This is, this is what most municipalities base their building codes off of. And they're constantly updated, usually every couple of years. Right now, obviously, our, our most current building codes uh, in the city of Longmont are not based off of the most current building codes internationally. And so most builders do actually know what the newest and highest uh, and best ways to build homes and developments are uh, outside of that. So what I'm saying is that Longmont needs to be at the forefront of always being consistent with the newest building codes coming out internationally. This leads to zero waste developments. This leads to higher, de higher density, unfortunately does mean uh, more folks, but it means actually higher sustainability and more eco-friendly developments. And then the other thing I do want to talk about a little bit is there are programs available to do energy audits and water audits on some of our older housing. But again, the city needs to be up to date as far as what green building means, and our international building codes do address that. The city needs to be up to date with those as well. Going last is easy. <laughs> I echo everything they said. <laughs> um, so I already brought up the point about older homes becoming more energy efficient. Boulder County and the city of Longmont, I think several years ago, had a program where you could have an energy audit and improve the energy efficiency of your home and they gave you a loan that you could pay through your taxes over a period of time. I don't know if that's still in effect or not, but I think that would be a good thing to get back to. And also, everybody mentioned, or several people mentioned affordable housing. I think what we need to do in the city is attract developers that are specialized in affordable housing buildings. And most of the developers that are coming to town aren't necessarily in that business. And I think the city also needs to partner with uh, Habitat for Humanity, Longmont Housing Authority, the Boulder Housing Authority, to use available land that the city has that could be donated to build affordable homes for uh, firemen, policemen, teachers, etc. Okay, thanks to everyone for those responses. So we're going to do the quick. No, we didn't. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please. <laughs> sorry. Uh, board two candidates. So, and I think um, it's, yeah, Jeff's turn to go first. Thank you, Marsha. Sorry about that. <clears throat> well, smart growth, I mean, it's, you could define it in a number of different ways. If we're talking about building housing, I think that we need to be putting in, into our codes standards that are higher than they're required in, the, in these building codes. Aaron hit on that, is that the international building codes get us to a further point. We can do things like smaller lots, smaller <coughs> homes, shared resources like, a, uh, like one water tap for four houses, for example. Water tap's a huge cost for a new home. Increasing the densities makes better use of our land, infill development on retail and um, residential housing. It would be uh, desirable. What we need to do is figure out a way to get owner-occupied homes out there because we can build a lot of apartments. We also need to be able to have people help build their equity and develop a way to get, uh, you know, to build their wealth. Now that that is kind of Habitat's mission, and that, that's a mission that uh, we we could uh, promote in Longmont with just how we put together our land use codes and allow people to, like I said, share a common water tap, share 
resources that way on a smaller lot and become more of a community oriented uh, developments. Thank you. I'm really glad I got to go last because I think that there's something that I want to say to everybody. A few people came close to it. Ron came pretty close to it. But what we need to do is have vision and we need explicit recognition of what's going to change and nobody has said that. Everybody's talked about what incremental changes we could make, but if you make the incremental changes without having an overriding vision, and yes, to some, it's to some extent an overriding plan, you could end up with mess. One of the messes that we have right now is our relationship with RTD. Everybody says, our tra public transportation is not serving us, but then RTD says, but you don't have enough ridership. And the, the, the actual truth is that both are right. RTD doesn't serve us and we don't have enough ridership. We need to right size our public transportation so that the vehicles that we have are full. Right. And everybody, <laughs> yeah. And, and the city needs a vision that counts for all of that. Everybody mentioned a piece of it, but what we need is a vision that counts for all of it. We need to understand what our city's gonna look like when it's changed. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna do the yes or no questions here, kind of uh, close to maybe about a half an hour, 25 minutes, well, they can as well give their closing statements. But just to wake everybody up, we'll do some quick lightning round questions here. And um, there are two of them. And I will start with you first here. And this is the first question. Do you believe climate change is human caused? Yes or no? I honestly don't know. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Okay, we'll start with Jeff for the next question, which is, have you or will you accept campaign contributions from oil and gas interests or their associates? Absolutely not. <laughs> Never. No, and I wouldn't let them do an independent expenditure either. That wouldn't appear on my campaign finance report, but there could be a pathway that someone will get that support. No. They've learned in the past by donating, donating to me, they don't get my vote. And no, I would not. Okay. okay. Uh, I think they have their set over here. Okay. Uh, I have not. I have not. I have not. No, heck no. <laughs> uh, I'm not accepting any or, uh, endorsements, nor do I accept funds. I have not accepted any from them, and I did not plan to, but and I don't think they're going to give me any anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they've never offered me any. I don't think they will, but I wouldn't take it if they do. <laughs> okay, thanks to all of you for that. So um, the next topic we are going to cover, and we touched on it a little bit, um, is uh, relating to agricultural land. So um, I'll ask everyone this question and um, two minutes for each of the candidates to answer. And I think we are back starting with the word two candidates again. So this is the question. The Longmont Zoning Ordinance has a category for designated agricultural land and Envision Longmont discusses the need in Section 5.4 to preserve farmland. Yet zoned farmland does not show up on the Envision Longmont land use map, and there seems to be no plan to preserve farmland as stated. Instead, it appears developers are engaged in a land grab. What will you do to preserve farmland in Longmont, and how and why will you do that? And we'll start uh, with Marsha. First of all, I think that we should have some clearly stated rules 
and we should have a no exception clause associated with them. We have an example going on right now with developments and easements <coughs> or exceptions. So for example, there's a lot of controversy going on right now about the same <coughs> development project and whether the 250 foot setback from the river or the river channel um, is going to be preserved in all cases of development or only in most cases of development. And I think that the answer has to be in all cases. I think in farmland, it pretty much amounts to the same thing. We have land that's designated as open space. It can be used for agriculture under certain circumstances. We need to clarify that too because I'm not sure that um, a hog farm, for example, is a good agricultural use for the open space surrounding uh, Longmont. And yet, it certainly is agricultural use. So I think we should pay a little bit more attention to that. And the other thing that we need to pay attention to that about is to make sure that we have regulations that just like on houses and lots, we're going to have something that is going to keep the uh, oil and gas developers from saying, well, there aren't any setbacks big enough to keep us from fracking that land. And we need to do something to subvert the forced pooling that is easy to do on agricultural land. So we really need to set up more safeguards around our reserved agricultural land and we need to be starting serious planning for the worst case scenarios when it comes to that. Thank you, Marcia. So um, we're <clears throat> a lot of work's being done right now on um, aligning the land use with Envision Longmont with zoning and other things that are uh, required to put that plan into effect. Uh, we are in a situation where we have a growth boundary and we're, if we're gonna build out, we have to decide how that land will be used. There's still agricultural land within the city limits or within the growth boundary of Longmont. If that's gonna be kept as farmland, we have to make that decision based on uh, any annexations that we come afford. If, it, if it's the highest and best use of, its, of the land, well then we are going to need to uh, keep it that way but I'm, I'm not sure that the people that own that land are going to feel the same way the time to make those decisions is that if there's an annexation request and that would be we have a couple of, of referrals in there right now my biggest concern about agricultural land is it being dried up with uh, cities buying up water and having water available for agriculture is part of our economy and we need to make sure that we don't uh, throttle that off totally by not having enough water to lease to farmers on dry years when, they're, when their native rights are not essentially enough. When we talk about growth though, it's kind of hard to control people coming here. I mean, 100,000 people, 100, people a year move to the front range and um, this is really creating a whole host of issues. Our housing costs, our water use, our development activity are all impacted by this, this huge rate of growth that's coming from all parts of the country. And that's really uh, part of our big challenge moving forward. Thank you. I'm going to go to the uh, Avalanche candidates and I'll start with you, Paul, on that question. What would you do to preserve farmland in Walmart? Uh, I would stop, stop uh, burning every bit of uh, agricultural land that comes before us into high density residential, which is what's happening right now. Two weeks ago, we turned 750 acres in one night over from agricultural land into land redevelopment for um, market rate housing. So, among both my relatives were, I mean, both my sides of my family were farmers. So this is something I really care passionately about. In the comprehensive plan, we have four sentences to go to reserve agriculture. It's kind of lip service. 
We aren't really doing that. And in fact, we are trying to purposely rezone out everything in the city that is agricultural and confine it to the edge, thinking that open space is the same as farming. It isn't. Open space is open space. So I would like to see us actually seriously address this issue, because we have farms like Olin Farm, which is now being completely surrounded by houses. That makes it almost impossible to farm. We have people on Rogers Road, we have all kinds of people who bought land here, so that they could have small farms. And um, we're getting rid of them. And I think it's outrageous. Thank you. I don't know a whole lot. Um, I'll be honest. Uh, it seems like most of Longmont is already residential or commercial. And um, I can't say what uh, is happening because I really don't know. I don't think that we need to make sure that um, every farm stays a farm. However, I've been here for 46 years. I chose to move here. I don't want to say to people who are coming now, I'm here and you can't come. I think people need a place to live. I think there's a lot of farmland to the east of us um, on the plains. As I've traveled across Colorado. There's many, many miles and miles of land where you don't see a house for um, a long time so I'm not um, I, I guess I don't know enough about this in long run to um, have a strong opinion one way or the other okay, thank you. several years ago there was an initiative with the Denver Regional Council of Governments and it was called the vision 2020 and out of that came the idea that we would have receiving communities, and these would be communities that had distinct patterns and were separated by open space and agriculture, and that agriculture and the open space and farms would be managed by the county elements. The city elements would be responsible for urban growth, would be responsible for schools and transportation, and, and managing that growth. So I don't know who asked this question, but I can't give you a, a straight answer because now I'm kind of pondering it. It becomes increasingly difficult to manage a city if you create a lot of exceptions. Enclaves create exceptions. We pay the city manager and the staff good money to run the city in an efficient manner, to come up with good transportation plans, good plans for moving the city in a positive direction. While it is, I think, a noble cause, I think agriculture should stay in the vein, in the purview of the county, and not necessarily the city. But we're going to lose a lot of hair trying to manage all these different elements. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I kind of look at this in a couple different ways. One being that when I grew up here, uh, I was friends with uh, some folks that had big family farms, big family farms here in Longmont, who have since sold off those farms and those areas have been developed. For instance, almost the entire Southwest Longmont development used to be Schlegel Farms. I was very good friends with the Schlegels. I'm still good friends with the Schlegels. And one of the biggest reasons that they chose to sell that off outside of the economy, the children didn't want to continue farming that property. So forcing people to maintain agricultural land when they don't have anybody to take it over and a very limited in number of folks that do want to take over such uh, such large responsibilities is a whole different issue that ties into this question. Outside of that, uh, we have a state zoning uh, currently in Longmont. It's going to change to rural zoning once we get done with our, our code updates and our zoning updates. But that still allows small hobby farms and small agriculture. And I still approve of that and I still want to see that uh, happen as far as open space and conservation easements, agricultural usage is still allowed on open space and conservation easements. I've done appraisals on these properties and I know that some folks actually utilize that to help lower their assessment <coughs> taxes. 
because if they're not doing anything with it, they get charged more. If they have some grazing or if they do hay, they get charged less. So, so there are things that we can do to maintain the environment of agriculture, agricultural land, but in the city of Longmont's footprint proper, I think we're, we're really running out the clock on this and we should just protect the buffer around to protect the ag around that. Thank you. So conservation easements have worked in Longmont. I know Boulder County and the city have teamed up together over the years to protect some of the farmland. The question here is a delicate balance because you have people that own the land and they're free to do what they want with it. And you can't force them. Like Aaron said, a lot of the younger kids don't want to farm or do what their parents did, and they decide to sell. How do you convince them not to? In some instances where Boulder County and the city have purchased open space land, they've probably paid more than land is worth currently, but that's one way for us to do it, is to incent those people to sell it to the city or to the county, as opposed to developers. Okay, thank you very much. And then over to the mayoral candidates, and I believe Brian, you are first on this question. Thank you. What do you do to preserve farmland in Well, well, first of all, um, the, it links. This question links a lot. Well, thank you. Uh, this 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 question links very closely with uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight. And I've said this comment before. Everybody in this room, we're all at fault with a lot of the issues that we're dealing with. On one hand, we want to make Longmont very beautiful. We love our open space. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we have slow, reasonable, low growth. We love our Longmont. But at the same time, uh, we want affordable housing. We want to help the less fortunate. We want to make sure that those people who want to come to Longmont are the first to champion. We all belong in Longmont. But it's like we're almost like we're schizophrenic a little bit trying to figure it out. So I guess my answer is you look at the plan. Uh, none of us up here, no one who, who whether you've been mayor, whether you've been on city council, six years, eight years, whatever, none of us have done this alone. We have 100 years, 100 plus years of history in this community where we are building upon what has come before. And right now what we need to do is keep doing what they have built. We need to focus that open space, which is basically agriculture land, on the outskirts of Longmont. We need to look at those farms within Longmont. If the owners want to keep it a farm, let them keep it a farm. But uh, if long, the Longmont Area Comprehensive Plan says we need high density, we put it there. If it's low density, we put it there. If it's ag land, we put it there. And, uh, and uh, as a council, we do have discretionary power when someone wants to annex in. We don't have to make that high density residential housing. That's why I voted against the, the, the last handful of apartment complexes because I don't think we should be eating up um, our ag land, our open space, and uh, we can set reasonable limits for when a developer wants to come into our family, so to speak. It's different if they're already in and they're already zoned that way. So um, that's my answer. It all depends. It just all depends. What's the need? What do we want to do? It depends. Thank you. And Roger. I think we're very fortunate in Longmont to have the uh, open space boundary we have. You look at Lafayette. Louisville and Erie, uh, that's kind of a tragedy over there, but our success has been, uh, when I was in city council, working with Boulder County and partnering with them. Uh, sometimes we, you know, say uh, not so good things about the county's power, but believe it or not, they do a lot of good for us. In fact, I uh, had a situation when Ron Stewart was a commissioner. We actually went over into Weld County and bought open space with Boulder County's money and that was to protect Longmont. Now that's an unusual thing to have happen, but it worked. Uh, you know, Weld County didn't matter. They got the money, and uh, I think it worked well. The thing I think we ought to try and do is use con conservation easements as much as we possibly can. You know, they work in the county, they can work in the city, and uh, pay the farmer something uh, so the value of their land continues to, to be there, and they, they can make a living on it. And back to the open space, uh, we just have to we just have to purchase the land if we want to preserve the land. 
and you leave it up to the landowner, uh, they're probably going to look for the money they can get out of it. But Longmont has done a good job of purchasing open space, and we ought to continue to do that. And um, that would be my thought on trying to preserve agriculture and open space in our city. Thanks, Roger. So nobody has actually addressed the question of should we have an agricultural zoning classification in the comprehensive plan. I think it was an oversight that we don't have one. If you don't have one, you can't label anything that's actually agriculture agriculture if there is no zoning classification. Simple as that. A couple of other things. This city was actually founded by farmers. That's why we have the forethought on water resources. This is why the dependability of electricity caused them to say, we're gonna have our own utility. It's self-sufficiency. The question is, and this is a question that Strong Towns, that blog that I told you about, has asked, and it was answered by Olin Farms. Could your city survive for 30 days if we were cut off from the outside world from food resources? Who likes to eat? <laughs> I don't even know if we could survive 15 days. The critical part about preserving agriculture and doing everything we can is self-preservation, folks. Besides the open land, you know, helping do carbon sequestration and growing things and keeping the water coming back into the soil and recharging the water table, it also prevents catastrophic things that we've seen in, in flooding and, uh, and heavy rain events where you have everything that's pavement, you get flooding. If you have open ground, you have the ability for that water to be absorbed. So let's keep some farmland. I think that doing the policies that Boulder County has partnered with us, doing conservation and um, paying farmers to keep that in active agricultural use is great. We also have contracts to sell farmers excess water that we have. We need to keep doing that. And we could even maybe start partnering with our local farmers like Haystack Mountain, Haystack Mountain Goat Dairy, they could run some goats on the farm and we could have some great goat cheese. <laughs> okay, well it is time for the candidates to give their last statement, their closing statement. And wait, did you guys not answer this question again? Wait, no. Roger, what are, Greg, what were you pointing at? For your excellent timekeeping, I, I want to say. Um, so each of the candidates is going to have two minutes to, to give a closing statement. And I guess I feel like we should do the mayor or the mayoral candidates um, in, in one you know chunk and then let all of us city council candidates um, do theirs. So um, trying to keep track of who has started first and second, I think we will um, begin with the mayor, uh, the three mayoral candidates, giving their two-minute closing statements. And I believe that we will be starting with you, Sarah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, Roger, please, why don't you Thank you, first? Yeah. Ryan. Thanks, I'm so sorry, thank you. I, I was waiting for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say, what a privilege it is to see this turnout that we had tonight. Uh, this is what this community is all about. They're a caring community. That's why we have such a great community, and uh, it's simply because of you people caring about what happens in your community. So thank you for coming. I did want to make one statement that I didn't get a chance to uh, concerning Chimney Rock, uh, this storage of water, and uh, I, Chimney Rock, my, uh, I'm definitely in favor of just 6,000 feet because that's what the staff recommended. But nobody here tonight, and I didn't hear much on city council ever says, well, 10,000 would be better, but how about the rate payer? Nobody ever talks about the rate payers and what it's going to cost the rate payers. You know what your rates are doing. We, sewer rates just went up. Yep. Electric rates went up. Yep. Water rates are going up. Yep. My stand is if we can get the amount of water that I think we need, and not charge our ratepayers anymore. That's the right thing to do for the community. And that's why I firmly believe that 6,000 is the right way to go. Because I hear from a lot of people saying uh, it's getting very difficult to afford to live in Longmont. And I don't want people to have to leave Longmont because of some things that we can control. So 
I wanted to make that statement. But again, I appreciate you coming out. I uh, all of us would appreciate your vote, obviously. And uh, but thank you for your time and thank you for your job, maybe too, on the resilience. So we had a good session, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sarah, do you want to go second? No, actually, I'll let Brian go second. <laughs> <laughs> Since given the option. Uh, the, uh, I've had the opportunity to serve Longmont for six years. And uh, I think that I've done a good job. And I'm asking basically for a slight raise and a promotion at work. And, uh, and I'd like to, and I, I get frustrated. I do, I get frustrated. And I go home and I talk to my wife, and I, but, but, but people don't understand. She says, you're an elected official, Brian. I mean, suck it up, put on your big boy pants. But uh, there's a couple, one thing I want to address tonight is fracking, okay? Because that bugs me the most. Um, I first learned what fracking was, was based the, the week I was going to be sworn in as a city council member. Brian Hansen took me over to a uh, union and we met with some residents who, they had a fracking rig going, they were gonna, it was going to go in behind their house. And I learned about it, started learning, started learning. I got a phone call from Brandon Schaefer. Brandon Schaefer was the president of Colorado Senate, Democrat. He said, Brian, I'd like to appoint you to the governor's oil and gas task force, but we're both going to get in trouble because you're a Republican. And I'm a Democrat, I'm supposed to appoint a ringer. And I said, well, why are you appointing me then? He says, I, I know a little bit about you, I just want you to go down and I want you to be you. I went down, I was me. I went to war with the governor, went to, the oil, went to war with the oil and gas task force. Tish Schuler, Josh Penry would come to my office, I've been offered bribes, I've been threatened with my life. Last night, people would say, oh my gosh, we'll stand with you. You know what I was thinking? Nobody stood with me before. <coughs> I'm still here. People say, oh, Brian, but you're tired. I'm exhausted of this fight. I'm exhausted, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop. And I'm doubly exhausted because most of the people in this room are against me. And I'm fighting to protect our, our community from fracking and heavy industry. The way I do it is a little different than you guys. I fought for the oil and gas regulations. We have a de facto ban in Longmont on 98% of our city as a that's it. Anyway, Brian Bagley, vote for me. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Sarah Levison. I'm running for mayor. I served you for eight years. And one thing that I didn't mention is that the oil and gas industry spent $10,000 in 2011 when I ran for re-election. Why do you think they spent that much money? They don't want me back in there. They don't want me to be elected this time because they know that I categorically stand up for our people. I stand up for our people for many, many different things. And I know that I'm not as tall, I don't gesture as much, I'm not a courtroom attorney. <laughs> However, I have a strong moral compass and I just don't do things that aren't right. I'm sorry, you know, I'll get beat up for it too. Everybody gets beat up, but. You know, my skin's pretty thick. You can stick me with a hypodermic needle at this point, it won't puncture. I just want to say fracking is not the only issue. We have to have a strong community. And what I see in this room tonight, and what I saw with the sustainability plan being brought to fruition these last couple of years, is that we have a group of people that we don't have to stand alone as a council or as a mayor. We've got all of you. And I want to encourage you to hold everyone's feet to the fire. So I would like you to vote for me, Sarah Levison. So not only am I strong about fracking, but I found a way to raise people out of poverty with a new anti-poverty program. That's, that's sustainability too, economic sustainability for our families. I brought a summer lunch program to Longmont so those kids that are hungry get fed. So I do some of the social stuff and I know some of the science stuff. But I'm not ever going to lie to you, and I pledge that every day as mayor, I'm going to work hard to make your life better. That's the bottom line. And now it's city council candidates. So um, we will go with the at-large candidates first. And I believe that you went, uh, let's start in the middle. How about you start first, Ron? So 
two minutes. Two minutes. I, I'm Ron Gallegos, and I had previously been on the council. I was on the council that built the rec center, the museum, the sandstone ranch. We expanded the senior center, and most of the, the thing I'm really proud of is we got Next Life started. So from that perspective, I think I'm a visionary. I think I'm a dreamer. People ask me why I'm running for council, and I tell the little story. Well, I walk Garden Acres Park two miles every day. Some days I take my blue rubber gloves and my little bag because I have to pick up trash because that's my work. This is my town. That's why I'm here. A lot of words tonight, huh? A lot of words. Um, well, you know, as a native of Longmont, I truly want to work to bridge the history and traditions of this fine city with the future of what our city will be. And what I mean by that is I want to do it through a community-based values approach, okay? And that means you will not be voting for me to fill a seat on city council. You'll be voting for us to fill a seat on city council. I pledge absolutely to uphold the best interests of the citizens at large. And while the citizens at large may disagree with each other, whatever the prevailing opinion is will be what I support because that's what the city needs is true representation of what the city wants. As such, I would like to uh, talk a little bit also about EcoCycle. Um, I think some of you can see that uh, there's something a little bit different on this, this panel. Uh, I was born probably around the exact same time as EcoCycle, okay? <laughs> and as such, EcoCycle and I are like siblings. We grew up together. And it's become a very amazing, a very amazing organization. And so it's been instilled, it's born and bred into me. Sustainability, recycling, uh, conservancy, stewardship, okay? Those are the kind of things that I truly believe in, and I will take that to the city council if elected. With that, I would like to leave you with one thing, and I'd like to paraphrase Woody Guthrie, if I may. This land is your land. This land is my land. I'll fight fracking. I'll take a stand. In 2017, roll with Rodriguez. Thank you.
about this earth and the future of this earth for the future generations. And so do I. But sometimes we have some different ideas about how to go about it. Climate change has been happening for millennia. Back in the Middle Ages, there was a, a Middle Age warm period of about 400 years when it was so warm that they could grow grapes in northern England. It's now too cold for that. In the 16 and 1700s, the river in London used to freeze over every year. People would ice skate on it. It was especially, it was cold during the American Revolution, a lot colder than it is now. Things have been changing. I've kept track of the amount of um, temperature change for the last 24 years on my XL utility bill. The average temperature of the, for the year has gone up and also down. The CO2 is now about four hundredths of a percent of the atmosphere. When the ice cores were laid down in Greenland, it was 0 0.07, it was, um, I'm sorry, seven hundredths of a percent. It was almost twice as much as it is, as it is now. So I doubt that CO2 is the cause of global warming, although that seems to be the prevailing opinion. Without fossil fuels, we'd be living as people did in the 17th, 18th century. My annual natural gas bill is below $300 a year in a duplex built in the 1960s. I use insulation in my windows in the winter. My electric bill is usually between 150 and 200 kilowatts. I think we need a balance. I'd like to lead by example, and I am. Thank you, Kathy Jarrett. Forgive me for reading, but um, in order to keep Longmont, Longmont's economy thriving, and keep a balance between the built environment and the natural, natural environment, and to keep give uh, social justice to every resident of Longmont. We need to um, move forward to a truly representative democracy for Longmont. We have to make decisions for the future, the far distant future, based on traditional American values of common sense, fiscal responsibility, economic opportunity for all, civil rights and justice, and environmental responsibility, especially. We need a functioning government that represents all the residents of the town and solves problems with decisions based on analysis and research of the problems, understanding and withholding and, and upholding our constitutional rights and community values, and listening to all the citizens. We need, the decisions should never be based on business buddies, paid lobbyists, religion, or political thought. I'm asking for your vote to continue to serve you. Together we can fight against uh, what is wrong and fight for what's right. I know most long waters know the difference. There were two candidates and Jeff. Jeff? Yeah, I've got a written statement too, but I'll, I'll add to some just for fun. <laughs> So the quality of life we experienced in Longmont didn't come, uh, did not happen by accident. Our predecessors had the foresight and the courage to build robust infrastructure for our citizens. Council needs to continue this tradition <coughs> of providing for the future. When you get farming project and moving forward with more renewable energy are examples of redundancy and resiliency our community has historically embraced. I didn't give you the answer you wanted to hear tonight on fracking. It's not because I like fracking, it's because I'm a pragmatist and the realist and there's, the oil companies have more money than God and they all wait and they'll just burn us up. I just want to make sure that people understand that I do not approve of fracking and if there's a way to stop it, I will do that. Tonight was about reshaping the conversation to, so to fully embrace a sustainable, resilient long run. It's going to take community buy-in and understanding in order to make, be, make this whole sustainability thing successful. Some of the, of the challenges in changing behavior will become apparent <coughs> as we start down this path. Starting is key and communicating the value to 
to everyone is something that I am already doing. Like I talked to my neighbor, he says, you know, you can save yourself like 18 bucks a month on your on your trash bill. So <clears throat> those are some of the ways I communicate to our neighbors. I will continue to protect the character of Longmont and move us forward to a future we can create together. I'd be honored to con continue serving as your independent, thoughtful representative for the future of Longmont. I humbly ask you to vote. talking to a lot more people in all months than I have ever done before and I've learned a lot from it and I think first of all we should go back to the first principles of sustainability which is that you don't take more than you need you don't grow bigger than you have room for and you tread lightly on the earth and right now what is happening in Longmont is that we are in danger of losing what we've been, a sustainable society. And the reason that we are in danger of losing it is because we really haven't internalized the problem. What's best about Walmart is that we are built like an independent community. We have people who work here, living here. We have people at every tier of society working here, but you know what we're getting that is not good? We're getting segregation. And no mean racial segregation or cultural segregation. What I mean is economic segregation. And because we have that, we have people with too much, and too much is a scary thing. We have the very wealthy with too much land, too much irrigation, too much space occupied. They can be wealthy without committing those crimes against the planet. We have the unfortunate who, because of segregation, are incurring too much of something else. They're incurring too much risk. Who lives out there by the place where those permit, that, where that spacing permit is? It is the mass fortunate, it is people in trailer parks, and what we need to do is integrate our community. We need to replan the community so that it takes everyone into account. Thank you. So that does conclude the debate. Thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you, thank you for your uh, polite listening and your uh, response to the candidates. Um, somebody asked that all the candidates say their name one more time loud and clear so that everybody uh, maybe couldn't see their names and knows who they are. So if you don't mind just starting from that end, and we'll just roll right through. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Jeff Moore, your current board two council representative. I'm Marcia Martin, and what I am is a futurist. I think we need somebody on the name. Oh, sorry, it's just the name. I'm still Marsha Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Levison running for mayor. I ask for your vote. Roger Lang, thanks for being here. Brian Bagley running for mayor, and of course I need your vote. Alex Samori. Aaron Rodriguez. <laughs> Ron Gallego. Thanks for sharing that space there. <laughs>